Good morning, friends and family. It's another great day in the Lord. I um, actually had not planned specifically to do a video, though I probably would have done it at some point during this day because I have just felt such a burden and have felt what, the, what I feel the Lord put on my heart to get the word on YouTube. Get the word out there on the internet, not just specifically YouTube. I also do an Anchor podcast on um, on Anchor. I do a podcast. It's under City Changers, Illinois. And uh, doing the same thing, putting the word out there on the internet. And the word, the word of God will not return void. Amen. So we're in Revelations chapter 10. So get your notebooks out, get your Bibles out, get your journals out. It's a time, uh, this is a time for testimony. So in Revelation, between Revelation 10 through Revelation chapter 14, um, they, this describes the events that will occur at the middle of the seven-year tribulation. And this explains John's repeated mention of the, the three-and-a-half-year time segment in one form or another. So... At the beginning of this period, the Antichrist began to make his conquest by promising to protect the Jews, to assist, assist their building of the temple in Jerusalem. But after three and a half years, he's going to break his agreement, invade the temple, and begin to persecute the Jewish people. And however depressing, however upsetting, discouraging those events are in this middle segment of the tribulation it, and, and, and it very well is it very well may be very discouraging to many people but God let's remember God is not without his witness to the word in Revelation 10 and 11 there are three important testimonies that we're going to go over it actually I think go I think I actually go into um yeah, verse 11, 10 and verse 11. And those three important testimonies are, number one, from a mighty angel, number two, testimony from the two special witnesses, and number three, the testimony from the elders in heaven. So the uh, testimony of the, let's see, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, of the mighty angel, more than 60 references, note that, more than 60 references are made in Revelations to, this, to the angels, or to angels. They are God's army sent to accomplish his purpose on the earth, right? Believers today seldom think about these servants of God, but read Hebrews 1, chapter 14. One day in heaven, we shall learn all about all that they have done for us and all they they did for us here in the earth while we were present in the earth realm. The, the description of the angel in verses 1 through 4, this angel amazes us for he has some of the characteristics that belong especially to the Lord Jesus Christ. John had seen and had heard a strong angel. And actually, the same Greek word is here translated, quote, mighty. All angels excel in strength. See Psalms 103. But apparently, some have greater power and authority than others do. So we first saw the rainbow around the throne of God earlier in Revelation chapter 4, I believe it was. Now it sits like a crown on the head of this messenger. The rainbow was God's sign to mankind that he would never again destroy the world with a flood. So even in wrath, God remembers his mercy. Who, whoever this angel is, he has the authority of God's throne given to him. God is often identified with clouds. God, We see this in Exodus. God led Israel by a glorious cloud. And um, dark clouds covered Sinai when the law was given. When God appeared to Moses, it, it was in a cloud. It was in a cloud of glory, actually. 
The Bible says, uh, he maketh the clouds his chariot in Psalms 104. So a cloud revealed Jesus when he ascended to heaven. It received him. And when he returns, it will be with a cloud. See Revelations 1.7. We've, we've already done that chapter, but go back and, and hear or go over Revelations 1 if you missed it. The fact that the angel's face is, quote, as the sun corresponds to the description of Jesus Christ in Revelation uh, 1, verse 16. His feet correspond to the Lord's description in Revelation 1, 15. His voice, like a lion, suggests Revelations 5 and 5. So this being could well be our Lord Jesus Christ, appearing to John as a kingly angel. Jesus often appeared in the Old Testament as what? As the angel of the Lord. So this was a temporary manifestation for a special purpose. It was not a permanent incarnation. Two other characteristics would suggest identifying the angel as Jesus is the book in his hand and the awesome posture that he assumed. So the little book contains the rest of the prophetic message that John will deliver. Since our Lord was the only one worthy to take the scroll and break the seals, it might well be concluded that he is the only one worthy to give his servant the rest of the message. Right? So the angel's posture is that of, of a conqueror taking possession of his territory. He's claiming the whole world. See Joshua 1, verses 1 through 3. And of course, only the victorious Savior could make such a claim. The Antichrist, or the spirit of the Antichrist, will soon complete his conquest and force the whole world to submit to his control. But before that happens, the Savior will claim the world for himself. The inheritance that his father promised him in Psalms 2, verses 6 through 9. Satan roars like a lion to frighten his prey away. See 1 Peter 5, verse 8. But the lion of Judah roars to announce victory. We're not told why John was forbidden to write what, what the seven thunders uttered. The only sealed, quote, sealed thing in an otherwise unsealed book. So as we see in Revelations 22, actually 22, verse 10. The only sealed thing in an, other, uh, in an otherwise unsealed book. God's voice is often compared to thunder. It's usually for us to speculate when God chooses to veil his truth. See Deuteronomy 29. The declaration of the angel in verse 5 through 11. This declaration fills us with awe, not only because of what the angel uh, declares, but also because of the way that he declares it. It's a solemn scene. It's a solemn scene with his hand lifted to heaven as though he were under an oath. But if this angel is our Lord Jesus Christ, why would he take an oath? Well, in order to affirm the certainty of the words spoken, God did put himself under an oath when he made his covenant with Abraham. Hebrews chapter 6. And when he declared his son to be high priest, Hebrews chapter 7. And he also took an oath when he promised David that the Christ would come from his family, Acts, 20, Acts 2, excuse me, Acts 2, 29 and 30. So the emphasis in Revelation verse 6 in chapter 10 is on God, the creator. Their various judgments have already been felt by the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and more judgments are yet to come. The word that is translated time actually means delay. God has been delaying his judgment so that lost sinners will have time to repent. 
See 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9. He will accelerate his judgments and accomplish his purposes. Recall that the martyred saints in heaven were concerned about God's seeming delay in avenging their deaths in Revelation 6. And we already uh, discussed that chapter. How long, O Lord? How long? That has been the cry of God's suffering people from age to age. God's seeming dis delay in fulfilling his promises. It has given scoffers the opportunity to deny God's word and question his sincerity. As we look at Peter, uh, 2 Peter verse three or chapter 3, God's word is true and his timing is perfect. And this means comfort to saints, but to judgment to sinners. It means judgment to sinners. In the Bible, a mystery is a, quote, sacred secret. A truth hidden to those outside, but revealed to God's people by his word. The mystery of God has to do with the age-old problem of evil in the world. So some might say, why is there both moral and natural evil in the world? Why, why doesn't God do something about it? Well, of course, the Christian knows that God did do something about it. Because at Calvary, that Jesus was made sin and experienced divine wrath, wrath for a sinful world. He received that for us. We also know that God is permitting evil to increase until the world is ripe for judgment. See 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. Since God has already paid the price for sin, he's free to delay his judgment. And he can't be accused of injustice or unconcern. The signal for this mystery's completion is, is the sounding, actually, of the seventh trumpet. In chapter 11, verses 14 through 19, which we're going to be doing next. In fact, if I didn't say so, I'm doing 11 and 10 back to back. So the last half of the tribulation begins when the angels start to pour out the bowls in which is filled or completed, is filled up with the wrath of God. Revelations 15, 1. The direction that the angel gave John, or directions that the angel gave John in verse 10, should remind us of our responsibility to assimilate the word of God and make it a part of the inner man. Yes, make the word a part of the inner man. It wasn't enough for John to see the book or even know its contents and purpose. He had to receive it into his inner being. God's word is compared to food, bread, milk, meat, honey. As we, we see that throughout the Bible in many places, the, the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel knew what it was to, quote, eat the word before they could share it with others. So the word must always become flesh. As in John 1.14, before it can be given to those who need it. Woe unto the preachers or teachers who merely echo God's word and do not digest it and, and making it a living part of their being. God will not thrust his word into our mouths and force us to receive it. He hands it to us and then we must take it. Nor can he change the effects of the word that we that will have in our lives there will be both sorrow there will be joy there'll be bitterness and there'll be sweetness that is the word of god it's not a bed of roses it's not all peaches and cream so god's word contains sweet promises and assurances but also it contains the bitter warnings and prophecies of judgment the christian bears witness of both life and death 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. The faithful minister will declare all of God's counsel. Acts 20, verse 27. He will not dilute the message 
He will not dilute the message of God simply to please the listeners. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. The angel commissioned John to prophesy again. His work was not yet completed. He must declare God's prophetic truth concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and, and kings. The word nations usually refers to Gentile nations. John will have much to say about the nations of the world as he presents the rest of this prophecy. So next, and in closing right now, I'm going to close chapter 10. But in closing, we're going to go to chapter 11, the testimony and the ministry of the two witnesses, what we'll be discussing there. So I hope to see you there. I pray that you are studying with me. I pray that you come to this channel not to just listen to me, or, uh, but that you actually have come here to gain more hunger for the Word of God, because that's my prayer over you, that God will give all of us more hunger to study His Word, not only to study it, but oh, open us up to understand His Word. Abide by it, obey it, teach it, preach it, walk in it, Amen. Okay, I'm going to close here. God bless you each and every one.